our webinar on alternatives to course management software, which will be presented by University of Kentucky Reference Librarian Sarah Glassmeyer. Um, first of all, a quick introduction to the webinars. Uh, we produce them. This is Cali, uh, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction, a nonprofit organization. Uh, you can find us on the web at cali.org. Uh, and, and we do these things every Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the free service to all of our Cali member schools. So you're welcome to join us for upcoming webinars. Uh, and we'd love to hear your suggestions for topics or if you want to volunteer to host one, to present one like Sarah's doing today on, on a topic that you're familiar with, that you think other people in the law school world will find interesting, um, go ahead and shoot me an email and let me know. To keep up with webinar announcements, you can follow our blog, our Twitter feed, or our Facebook page. I'll post announcements about what's coming up in future webinars there. And we also record this, so this is going to be recorded. And we have an archive of past webinars and a few other videos up at calivideos.blip.tv. And you can find those by going to calivideos.blip.tv. And clicking this little, if you can see where my mouse is, this little link that says Episode Archive. And I'm going to give you a suggestion for one to watch uh, based on this webinar that Sarah's going to do. Uh, we have one uh, on Classcaster. It's called Webinar Classcaster. Uh, and this just goes over Callie's blogging system, uh, which you can find at www.classcaster.org. So, Got to do my job here and give a little plug to our blogging system. That's free for uh, professors and schools to use if you're a Cali member. Upcoming webinars: uh, Deb Quintel uh, helps helps people write Cali lessons, uh, so she is doing a series of webinars on how to write Cali lessons. This is her fourth one in the series. Uh, they're great if you're interested in learning how to write those lessons. Uh, so check that out next week. Week after that, uh, I'm going to do a webinar on using Facebook ads. Kelly just started using some Facebook ads recently, and it, to my surprise, actually increased our page fans by a bunch. So uh, just a little basic overview of how to use those. And I will go over that in two weeks. Uh, a couple other things. We encourage questions and comments during the webinar. Uh, you can raise your hand virtually. Uh, on your toolbar there, you should have a hand raising button or something like that. Uh, so if you see the hand raising button, you can click that. I, I see some people have found it. Go ahead and raise your hands right now. A few of you see it. OK. Great. Um, so if you have a question, you can raise your hand like that. And I'm going to lower your hand right now. And let me know. And I will unmute you, and you can ask a question of Sarah. Uh, feel free to do that at any time. Uh, and there's also a question function and a chat feature. So those also come straight to me. So send your questions that way as well. Okay, without further ado, Sarah is on the line. Say hi, Sarah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> She's a reference librarian, librarian at the University of Kentucky Law Library. So uh, like I said, she will be speaking about uh, alternatives to course management software. And I will let her take over from here. Let me switch our screens here. OK. Let me find the PowerPoint. I'm not seeing the PowerPoint. <laughs> no. Yes, the, uh, I'm not seeing the PowerPoint, Austin. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I thought y you were going to put it up. Do you want me to put it up? Oh, yeah. Please do. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, do you have it on your computer? Because it might be easier so you can move back and forth. Okay. Yeah. Let me... So everyone see my lovely desktop? <laughs> Okay. All right, great. Sorry about that, guys. Oh, yeah. 
Live TV. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, so hello everyone. <laughs> this is me. I'm Sarah. And today we are going to talk a little bit about how um, some alternatives to um, course management software like Twin or uh, WebCT or Blackboard, um, that sort of thing. So basically, in you know, the next 20 minutes or so, I've, um, we're going to talk, you know, why do this? Um, and then as the title indicates, we're going to spend most of our time talking about wikis and blogs. But there are some other options besides wiki and blogs, either just, you know, a piece of the course management puzzle or, you know, full-blown other course management um, system options. But throughout this, um, I don't know if you ever take like an aerobics class or yoga class, how they will say, you know, this is, you know, what you can do, but then if you want to increase your workout, you can, you know, add another step or add more weight. And, you know, I'm always like, yeah, whatever, lady. But <laughs> for the most part, what we're going to talk about is the low impact version. Um, basically, if you can use a word you know, processing software like Word, if you can get on the Internet, if you can cut paste, you'll be able to do anything that I'm going to talk about today, really. It's very um, simple. But I'll point out the times where you can you know, add the weight or take the extra step. Okay. Why I propose this topic, or why I wanted someone, you know, I just thought it would be a great topic to do. I didn't really think I would be the one doing it. Um, you know, I don't hate Twin or Blackboard, and I'll, I'll probably say Twin most of the time because my school is a Twin-centric school, but there is a Lexis project out there, Blackboard, and it's, you know, perfectly smurfy as well. Um, they're not terrible. I mean, they actually, there are a lot of good things, and one of them is they're all set up. I mean, it's a course management system ready to go. You know, you have your logins. All your students have logins because, you know, students never lose their Lexis and Westlaw passwords. Um, and so it's ready, all set up. Basically, all you do is upload your syllabus, say what you want to do, and you're good to go. And theoretically, it allows students to practice using, you know, Twin or um, Westlaw or Lexis, that sort of thing. But why I have kind of a philosophical problem with these Lexis and Westlaw sponsored course management systems is because, you know, back in the old days, and this is before my time even, um, Using an electronic database like Lexis or Westlaw was kind of a special event. You know, you went to your special terminal and you, you know, logged in and it was, you know, important doing this research and because, and that's a good thing because these cost a whole lot of money in the real world. And when I think, you know, students just get used to logging in every day and they, it just becomes another, Lexis and Westlaw, another website. It's like Google to them. They don't realize that this is a special thing, that it's going to cost you a lot of money to use in the real world. And then just another problem with them, that there, there's something when you talk about um, you know, websites or networks, that sort of thing, called walled gardens. And that basically means, like with Facebook, is a walled garden. Only your friends can see your profile if you have your privacy settings that way. Only people who are members of Facebook can see, you know, get into there. Um, and, you know, nowadays, especially when you have the interdisciplinary courses like law and psychology or law and business, it's very possible in these in our classes that we'll have not just law students who have the Lexis and Westlaw passwords. There's other students who are not familiar with the Lexis and Westlaw systems. And yes, it is easy to get outsiders of, uh, you know access to it, but it's just an extra step. And also, I mean, you know, not even just with students, you're, you can use these course management systems not for courses. You can have them for other planning purposes. But across institutions, not outside the law school world, um, and so it is kind of a walled garden. So. What is a course management system? What are we talking about today? Um, it's a system to manage courses. But um, it kind of varies how professors use it, how um, in-depth they get with it. For the most part, um, especially at UK, we have just become very twin-centric just for economic reasons, because printing out syllabi, printing out handouts has become really expensive in our, you know, we're a state university in a poor state. So we really just can't afford to do that. So now it's a mandate all classes have to use twin. Everything has to go up there, um, no more printouts or anything. So for the most part, it's just distributing course materials, document delivery, syllabi, handouts, um, electronic course packets. And this gets me a little nervous because I know there are copyright issues. I'm, this is not anything I have any real knowledge about, much to my you know, shame. I mean, not a lot of shame, but <laughs> I, mean, I know I should know about copyright, but I just trust there's other people on campus who will stop us we, you know, for the electronic course reserves. But you know, a lot of they just. You know, professors, they don't really know. They have their secretary scan in a copy and, you know, upload it to Twin. But that's another reason they, you know, use for Twin, as well as just links to either cases to read or, you know, blogs that, you know, other things on the web that they would want students to read. 
And that's the main reason that I've seen twin or Blackboard use. But there are other options, um, accepting assignments, not so much in the law school world, obviously, because for the most part it's you know, a final and then you're done. But in seminar classes, um, I notice a lot of our profs will have the students turn in several different versions of their papers and then you know, offer comments, send them back. So distributing documents and then, you know, again, to a lesser extent, communicating via email. For some reason, we have, when I'm setting up Twin Pages professors, they always request that we turn off the emailing function so students can't, can't email each other. And our students don't care because they use Facebook for the most part to communicate or Gmail. But, um, you know, to you know, send out announcements to students, have, there are you know, forums to have class discussions. Again, an online gradebook, and then even to a lesser extent, a course calendar, quizzes, polls, that sort of thing. So the first alternative we're going to talk about are wikis. And um, I think just because of my research interest and what I do, I've heard a program on wikis every conference I go to. But in case you haven't, um, they always start with saying that wikis is a Hawaiian word, and it means fast or quick. And really, all wikis are um, is a way of creating a website. And it allows for easy collaboration between people. And it's within the page. You just click edit, you don't, and you're re editing right on the page. You don't have to go to a um, back of the site. You don't have to do um, you know, anything technical like that. It's just all right there on the page. You have some options. If you, there's different kinds of software out there that if you want. If you have access to a server space, that's something you're comfortable with. You can self-host it. And then with that option, you have and you know, free or pay for the software, but you know, mostly, you know, this is not anything you should ever pay for. There's enough free ones out there. Um, but then you have the opportunity to change it a lot more to, you know, especially if you're very concerned about branding, so it all looks the same, it blends in seamlessly to your library website. Um, so you do have that option. So the main companies, PBWorks, WikiSpaces, MediaWiki. MediaWiki is one that you can. That's the people that run Wikipedia, and that's you can download and change and Google Sites. I did not um, include WetPaint, but that's another one. WetPaint I've used quite a lot. Um, before our demonstration today, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use PBWorks. Um, I think I actually just called it PBWiki. It used to be PBWiki, PB as in peanut butter and jelly sandwich, because that's how easy it is to set up a site. But they're trying to be a little bit more professional, so now they call themselves PBWorks. And they do have some enterprise plans that you can pay for, but everything I'm showing you today is all free. So really creating a site, um, you set up an account with PBWorks, and it's really just a matter of providing them an email address and then creating yourself a login and password. And then you're good to go. So for creating a site, you, you know, whatever URL you want, so you can have you know, Smith's Property Law, you know, if it's for a you know, professor like that. Here I just have Cali Blogs, Wikis, and these sites are up and available. You know, I'll just leave them up in perpetuity if you want to look at them or if you want to mess around if you've never had the opportunity to play with a wiki. I believe I set it so anyone can join and you can edit it. And then PBWorks, knowing that librarians use this a lot, um, or the educational world uses it a lot, you have different options. You, know, you pick for individuals, for education, for business, you know, type of company, library was one of the options. And then how do you want to use this workspace? And then collaborative classroom is one of the options. And really, these different workspaces don't change um, your site too much. It's just you know, what templates you have available um, for your pages. But, even that doesn't matter. I mean, you could do this, um, change it any way you really want to. So you signed up, and then as we were talking about walled gardens, I mean, walled gardens aren't a bad thing. Sometimes you don't want the world looking at your site. So you can make it so only um, members of the class look at the site, or you can have it open to the world. And you can make it so only you or the um, you know, certain people can edit the site. So if you just want you know, the law professor, they're, um, library liaison and our faculty assistant are the ones that can edit it. You can make it that like that, or you have it more collaborative for the students, you know, as part of the communication aspect of a course management system. If you want students to be able to have their own page and edit it, you can give them author permissions. So then after that, you accept their terms of service, and you're done. And this is what you're presented with. I mean, the site's created, and then you'll see you have two great big red boxes, one on edit and one on pages and files, and that's what we're going to look at next. But editing, it's really simple. So I'm clicked on the Edit tab. And then all this you can erase. Um, it should look kind of familiar for you. It's very similar to editing um, Word or um, any other word processing software. You, know, you can change the fonts. You, know, you have some options of fonts, not a lot. But you, know, you do have options of fonts or font size, headings. Um, really, um, and probably one thing also I wanted to point out, 
if you kind of see in the top bar there's a little globe, in case you're not aware, you just highlight some text, you click on that little globe with the paperclip looking thing, and then you can link to a URL, you can link to an email address, you can link to another page within the wiki. It's very easy to use these um, editing software. And then the other, um, the insert plugin, and we'll talk about that a little in a few moments. So this is when you click on page templates, and these are just ones that they've you know, if you're doing a course management or a course software page, a course page, these are some of the um, templates you might want to look at. And as I said, document delivery, document repository is a main function that I've seen Twen use for. So here's just the example document repository page. Again, all this text can be edited, but the way they have it, the instructions for editing the text appear on that page. So if this is your document repository page, it tells you exactly how you can um, edit the page you want, and it says, you know, it shows you how you can upload files. You have, you can upload almost any format you want, but one thing to be aware of, because this is free, you don't have an unlimited amount of um, documents you can upload, and PDFs take up a lot of space. I think with PB Wix or PB Works, you can get two, um, two gigs of space. So just, you might kind of have to budget yourself, maybe not upload everything at once, um, use Word documents instead of PDFs, or if you have access to a server or you can get server space at your institution, have your documents uploaded on your own server space and then just have a link to them so to save your um, allotment here on PDWorks. So here's how I edited that document repository page. I just knew it comes with a ta table. I changed that. You can change all the text within it. You can add links to documents you've uploaded. Um, you can really do whatever you want. And as far as creating a new page, if you don't want to use one of the samples, but honestly, even if you use one of the templates, all you do is just you know, select it all and hit backspace and delete it all on your brand new, fresh page. But if you don't want to go through that, the blank page, and here's what it looks like. And here's if the plugin is what I have marked on this page. And this is just a way of adding things to um, the wiki site other than just text. And you can add what they call their wiki magic, so a table of contents. If you have a very long page, so people can do jumps, you know, anchor links all the way throughout the page. So they can, you know, jump down to um, instead of scrolling down. Um, but the one that's most useful is that they have a box where you can embed either Google gadgets or anything really that has an embed code. And you'll, you know, if you kind of play around the web, you'll see embed this, you know, like a YouTube video, embed embed this into a site. That's where you would do that. And you just want the gadgets, the Wikipedia search box. Um, you could probably do a Rolio if you just wanted to, like, you know, search the law school page, something like that. And then they have a calendar plugin, but you know, if you use Google Calendar, you could do a cut and paste of a Google embed and embed that into your wiki page. The other option of things to use are blogs. Um, blogs are, you know, everyone I think knows what a blog is. Even my dad, who <laughs> never uses a computer, knows what blogs are. Um, but just in case you don't, it's a way, a very simplified way of publishing to the internet. Um, and again, you have the option you can self-host or you can develop, you know, have it hosted on some other site for free. And the two main ones that I've used are WordPress and Blogger. WordPress is an open source um, blogging platform, and then Blogger is owned by Google. And I'm using WordPress for this, and my former blog, I use WordPress, and I love it. And I use it for the um, backbone of my current site, which I have, is self-hosted, so you, know, you can transfer back and forth. Um, so I had an account, but again, it's very similar to the wiki. You create your account with them, and then you're good to go. You can create as many blogs as you want. You, and just like the other one, you set up your domain name, you give it a title, and then boom, you have a blog site. Um, blogs, as you've seen those for course management by sites requires a little more work on your part, um, but the little more work means you can customize it a little bit more. So when you click on site admin or if you just go to the URL of your site, then slash wp-admin, this is your dashboard, and this is where you kind of do all the work on your blog. Um, so to set it up so it becomes a functional CMS, you want to click on the Appearance tab, and here is where you change how your site looks. So you can really go wild, you know. Um, they have 76 themes that you can choose from. If you do this, use WordPress self-hosted, 
the number of themes you can choose from are in the hundreds, if not thousands. Um, but here, just you have 76 to choose from, and you can either just scroll through and search, or scroll through and just kind of browse, or you can search for different um, options of the tags they have here. For me, I wanted to be sure I had um, tabs along the top, and the option to customize the header, and to have widgets. Um, and almost all of them have widgets. But really, I'm kind of anal-retentive, and I just like these to look kind of professional. But again, you know, with a custom header, you can, again, go with the branding if you want to be a seamless you know, flow into from your library website. Or if you just want it really artistic and pretty, you can do that too. Um, as far as the widgets, these are just... Hey, Sarah? Yeah. We have a question. Let, okay. me, uh, let me unmute uh, Lucy here. Hey, Lucy? Uh, hi. Go ahead and ask I, your question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I just wrote it there too. You can just read it. I was wondering if WordPress is free, and if uh, one can alter the URL so it reflects the author, or if if there is some kind of default. That um, um, WordPress is free. Okay. Um, what do you mean by alter the URL for the authors? Like make it so it's like professorsmith.wordpress.com, or have it just professorsmith.com? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can answer both of them. To do the professorsmith.com, um, definitely if you self-host, you can do that. And I think there's a way you can have it point if you reserve a URL. You can have, yeah, you can you can reserve a URL um, and then have it point to you know, the wordpress.com site or the um, you know, blogspot.com site. That's totally possible, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Lucy. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And so widgets, uh, for the most part, you won't, I guess it depends on how you want to do your site, and you can kind of scroll through when you go to a WordPress, but you know, if you have like a delicious tags, like if you're you know, bookmarking sites for your um, class to look at, you can have that in the sidebar. But for the most part, I find just having pages is really useful, and um, we'll talk about pages in a second. And then meta is just your site admin. You don't need to have that, but I always just, whenever I set up a WordPress site, like to have that on the front page so I can just log into the dashboard part. So when you're using WordPress, you have two different options for um, the pages within this. Ones are posts, and posts are like the traditional blog. So those can be updated constantly. The newest one appears at the top, and that will be the, generally the first page you see when you come into your website. But you could use it like a traditional blog and um, have your you know, student communications. You know, This week we talked about the worldwide Volkswagen case. Let's talk about it here or you could use that to push course announcements, or you could just have it totally static. Pages are the other part of the WordPress blog, blogs, and these are, for the most part, static. I mean, you can always go back and edit them each week, um, but you don't have to, you know, you know, for this is like an about page, and you would put about this course, or um, you know, any of the other pages that you would want to put in the course. The one nice thing that is fairly new to WordPress, I think, this wasn't when I first set up my old blog, um, but you can nest your pages, and that's more, we'll see this when the uh, site is finished, but you could have a documents page, and then underneath that you create another page for your syllabus, and you have that nested in the about page. And it won't really change the way the about page, or the, you know, say this about page is documents, it won't change the way that looks, but on the sidebar, it kind of helps with navigation through the site. Um, and the nice thing about the blogging as opposed to the wiki, whereas the wiki, it was all, um, the WordPress or the Word editor, kind of like a Word document, which is called a WYSIWYG editor. I don't think I mentioned that earlier. And if you want to have an HTML embed, you kind of were limited just to the little plug-in boxes. With the blogs, you can either edit it the old way, which is under the Visual tab, or what I have here, the HTML tab. And now you're pretty much, you know, free reign to do whatever. If you, however much HTML you know, if you really know, you know, if you're good at coding, you can really customize your page to a great extent. Um, but otherwise, this is where, you know, again, with the YouTube example, the cut, paste, just drop it in here. Um, in this case, it's a Mito chat widget. So it, you know, again, allows for greater customization. Now with WordPress, you theoretically can upload documents. But I have to admit, um, I've done it before, but when I was creating this site, I just had a terrible time making it work. But you can see there's different file types. You can, you know, JPEGs or GIFs or PDFs or Docs. Um, you're limited to three gigs of space, so again, you kind of want to be judicious in what you load up, and maybe, if possible, use a server that um, 
you have access to to host this, the pages or the documents there and then link to them on the site. But it is theoretically possible to upload the syllabus so students can then download it on their own from the site. But I could not make it work for the purposes of this demonstration. And then they do have um, a deal with Poll Daddy, another one of those great professionally named Web 2.0 companies. If you did want to do quizzes, you can use Poll Daddy and it, you know, you create the quiz and just this little code appears on the site and then when you publish it, it looks like a little survey site. So here is what the site finishes. You can see along the top, you know, I have the pages, um, home, contact information, documents, quizzes. And then on the top box on the right-hand side, you can see where that nesting takes place. Like under the documents, there are the readings page and then a syllabus page. Some other options if you didn't want to do a full-blown site or, you know, as I was saying, the problems with the um, space limitations on both the wikis and the um, blog. For the document sharing, Google Docs is really great, especially for collaborative work because you know, sometimes if you have ever worked on a paper with someone or anything really, and you're emailing versions back and forth, they can get lost and, and confused and look which is the most recent and people, you know, especially if you get more than two people in the mix. But with Google Docs, you can have an, an unlimited number of people sharing the same document and going back and forth and all the edits appear there. So that would be really great, you know, especially you know, for seminar papers, student uploads it to Google Docs, shares it with the prof, prof can make his or her edits, you know, shares it back and the, the student can see that whole, you know, can see in the same version. Dropio and you send it are for larger documents, especially, you know, like see like a huge, you know, PDF syllabus, multi-page. It gets a little hard emailing that sort of thing. And what you send it does, um, and Dropio works the same way, but I just email this PDF to or the presentation to Austin. So that's how I have you send it in my mind. It creates a URL. So you can then have that URL and send it to an unlimited number of people. Um, and it's good for a week. So you could, you know, upload a syllabus, send that URL to all the students. They can download the syllabus and save it on their computers. They don't have to print it out. Paper saved. Um, multi, you know, everyone has access and doesn't get lost um, in email. But it lasts about a week. As far as doing discussion groups or um, communicating with students, Google Groups is a great free kind of forum, an email with serve service. Um, and you'll notice I've, you know, there's a Google site for just about everything. And I know some people get a little nervous about Google, but um, so if you do, that's okay. But you can really, you know, you have Google Docs. You could use a Google site for your um, wiki, and then Google Groups for the communication aspect of it all. And it's all totally free. Um, Mebo is one of the chat widgets or chat room free options. There's a whole bunch of other ones out there as well. Um, I just like Mebo because it has a good embeddable widget, but it does have ads. So that's something to be aware of. If you want to do quizzes, Google again, Google Docs under their spreadsheet option, they have. Um, a survey, you can you know, create a survey, and then you can, again, you get the embed code, so you either can, you know, under the HTML editor on the uh, blog or using the gadget um, or the plugin on the wiki, embed that into a page. But, um, so those are just, you know, if you have, like, just one thing, you just want to document share, you don't need a whole site or to use in conjunction with wiki and blogs. But there are other course management systems that are out there that are either, you know, free or open source. Wikio is, um, kind of a web 2 own company. It's free to use, and it's basically a course management system. It's, I think, more aimed at students, for students to work together in groups, but there's no rule that says a librarian or a professor can't go in there and use it as well, and use that as part of their course communications. Moodle and Sakai are um, open source, I think they're both open source, course management systems that you can then use and adapt to what you will. And then finally, um, Drupal, which is not a course management site, it's a content management system, the other CMS. Um, but for the librarians out there, uh, the computer services, special interest section, computing services, just did a web 2.0 challenge. And our course management site we use for that was all built using Drupal. So there are, you know, Drupal has different nodes and modules that you can use to create a site. But that's, again, the, you know, <laughs> the ultimate aerobic <laughs> exercise as far as creating a site goes. You know, um, so you have to have some pretty good skills to do that. but that is another possibility out there if you want to completely you know, forsake Twin and Blackboard and build a complete course management site on your own. So these options are there for you. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. I am happy to take any questions now, or here's my contact information. Um, you know, I'm always happy to answer questions about you know, anything I can or <laughs> point you to someone who would know the answer if I don't know it. Sir, I have a question. Which 
if you were setting one up, uh, if you were setting up your own course management with these options, which one do you think you would choose? I would probably use a wiki, and I use PBWorks quite a lot, um, not for course management, management, but just, you know, when I have a one-shot bibliographic instruction session, you know, just going to the property law seminar. So I would probably use a PBWorks wiki, and then in conjunction as far as the document sharing, a Google Docs or a send it, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. To get around the uh, limits? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I got, got another question from Lucy. Uh, Oh, actually, she just wants you to go back to the previous screen with the list of other course oh. management systems. Now, have you? Uh, do you have any experience with those those other three? Um, not personally. I've. I guess the year before last, um, the CSS I used Moodle, and I've heard of other people using that, and you know, kind of mixed re uh, mixed reviews on that. Mm -hmm. I played around with Wiggy just you know with myself, um, just experimenting with it. But you have never tried to run a course using any of these. Interesting. Uh, I have a question for the audience, actually. Has, has anyone uh, else tried to use these? You can just raise your hand. Tried to use uh, alternative course management systems. I see. I see a few of you there. Um, all right. Um, does anyone want to uh, volunteer? I, I just lowered your hand. Does anyone want to volunteer their experience right now? live and on the air. Oh, come on. Somebody does. All right, Tom Boone. I'm unmuting you. Hello. Hey, Tom. Um, I have played around with Moodle a little bit. Um, and for just sort of out-of-the-box um, functionality, it, it worked fairly well. I know that they had some problems with the Web 2.0 challenge last year. I think the, uh, uh, the chat rooms an issue, um, and but uh, I wasn't part of the back end of that, so I can't really speak to what the problems were. Um, I think that it's really great for out of the box functionality, though. And when you start customizing it a little bit, it's not necessarily built for a lot of uh, customization. Um, it can be customized, but it's not necessarily that easy to do it. And mm -hmm. what's available, like in terms of themes that are out there, is sort of a limited. Uh, number of themes that are out there, unless you want to completely build your own. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I've done, actually, I guess, about three or four courses with Drupal, um, including this year's Web 2.0 Challenge uh, site. And uh, that is, you know, for people who are here looking for something easy, Drupal is not going to be uh, the, the thing to dip your into the shallow end of the pool, so to speak. Definitely not for beginners. Right. But the advantage to Drupal is that if you learn that, you're learning a heck of a lot more than just course management. Right. Uh, you're learning how to build any kind of website under the sun because at, at its core, you know, it's just about pieces of content and being able to put those together. And just about anything on the web can be thought of as pieces of content, including anything in a course management system. And so if you do learn Drupal, you can build a system that integrates with your library website or your law school website or any website that you want to build. Um, and content management can just be a piece of that. Um, and after you've built that course site, you can easily transfer what you've learned to any sort of uh, web development uh, right. environment. But like I said, and as you agreed, it's not something for uh, someone who just wants to yeah, not just for the professor who wants to pick up and start exactly. his or her own. It's 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 yeah. not it's not for the Friday afternoon dabbler. <laughs> That's for sure. All right. Well, thanks for that, Tom. All right. Uh, I see. I see. Mark has his hand up as well. I'm going to unmute you, Mark. Yeah, I was just going to say, Austin, that uh, uh, with a couple of years of using Moodle, and uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not very uh, uh, advanced with any of this stuff, but Moodle was absolutely fantastic in terms of keeping track of things uh, in an orderly fashion. But also, we were recording the classes. we post the link up. And when the students would look at the class recording, uh, it would track it. So we were able to actually tell uh, who was watching the videos, who was not watching the videos. We could correlate it to their performance in the course and, uh, and actually um, sort of empirically show that some of the people who really did spend the time to uh, to watch the classes uh, were, uh, were benefiting from it. And, uh, and also, 
at least from the reporting standpoint, we were able to show that, that the students were not using it as a substitution for attending the course, mm -hmm. which was always the big deal about recording classes. You know, oh, right. they won't come, they'll just watch the recording. And in fact, you know, they were all going to the class, uh, and, then, uh, and then some would actually use it afterwards. So I really liked Moodle. It was, it was uh, pretty user friendly. I know there were some people who, who didn't necessarily feel the same way. Uh, but I think they were too ingrained into something else previously, and so they didn't you know, necessarily want to be as flexible. But, but I really liked it. Very good. So were, were a, lot, a lot of students watching the, the videos in general? Um, uh, a healthy percentage, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. All right, that, that sounds pretty good. Um, and I see that Emily, Emily Barney of, of UI, UIUC, um, uses Moodle as a course management system used by that school, at least. Um, oh, I'm sorry, she works at Chicago Kent. Um, but she knows that, actually, are you, are you on the call? Can I unmute you? Sure. OK. <laughs> Hello. Right. Yeah, I just finished um, the UIUC Graduate School for Library Science Online, and we use Moodle for absolutely everything. So I've seen a variety of courses offered on Moodle, and it does offer you know, a pretty standard interface, but I've seen a lot of flexibility in what each professor offered with the class and the kinds of ways that they used each one. Okay. So looks like a couple of good reviews for, for Moodle, at least. Um, okay, I see we're, we're actually uh, over time. Sarah, did, did you want to add anything else? Um, no, not really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I, I thank everyone for, for coming. I especially thank Sarah for presenting. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if anyone else has, yeah, yes, thank you. If anyone else has anything uh, they'd, they'd like to present, let us know. Um, and any other feedback, uh, you can email me or, or Sarah. Uh, any questions, let us know, and we appreciate it. And hopefully we'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys. Bye.